Welcome to Off The Bench podcast, where our guest this time is Olympic gymnast Becky Downey. Now, it was such a pleasure to speak to Becky just after she competed at the Paris Olympics, her third Olympics. Um, Yeah, her story is all about overcoming the odds. She's had a really difficult last few years where she's had the challenge of becoming a whistleblower um, for abuse in her sport. Um, Her and her sister Ellie really helped to lead that charge of exposing yeah, d- difficult issues and, and abusive behavior within British gymnastics. And she spoke to me a bit about the impact that had on her career. Um, we also spoke about what it was like to, to train through the grief and, um, the heartbreak of losing her brother Josh in the last couple of years. And really we spoke about her love for gymnastics too, because that is the thing that continues to drive her. She's an outlier in continuing within her sport in, at the elite level to compete into her 30s. And what drives her is wanting to make her sport better and also wanting to better herself and become a better gymnast, even at this late stage in her career. So, yeah, I really hope you enjoy this episode. I want to apologize for a couple of... um alerts you might hear during the episode. Becky's a popular person, so she had a couple of messages come through while we were chatting. Um, But yeah, I hope you really enjoy this episode um, with the wonderful Becky Downey. Amazing to have you here. Thank you for taking the time. Um, How has life been since Paris? It's been really nice to be home. I feel like just having that time to actually say yes to opportunities and to meet family and friends again and just be a bit more normal for a little bit has been really nice. Yeah, crucially, have you been in the gym? Have you been back to the gym? Uh, not to the gymnastics gym, we haven't. Um, I've been to my fitness gym, David Lloyd. Um, that's something that I definitely want to keep up for like life anyway. And I really do enjoy like my S&C side of things. So I've been just keeping fit ticking over, but no actual gymnastics. That's fair enough. I think everyone deserves a break. Um, what is that like though? Because your routine is so much a part of your life to kind of just step away from it. Has it felt weird at the same time? Yeah, it has actually. I'm so used to just having a plan and having structure. After a couple of days of doing nothing, I was like, right, I need a plan. I need to know what I'm doing and get some routine back. But it, as I say, it's been nice to kind of get things booked in, but different things other than training. And it has been really strange to some days get up and be like I don't have to go to the gym today like it's okay to actually rest and do other things and just accepting that it's quite strange but nice at the same time yeah and what's your go-to thing when you're resting like what's the thing you were putting off doing that you had the most fun doing because you could do it finally because you weren't training for the Olympics anymore oh I think just trying to do nothing is I find really hard um, so just to, I do enjoy generally just being home and just doing your day-to-day things, cleaning my house, watching telly, just pottering around. Um, but I feel like I have actually been busier than I anticipated since I've been back, like booking things in. So trying to get that balance between just having the time to do nothing, but then keeping busy as well. <laughs> yeah, fair. I mean, I, I, I feel like there's so much to talk about with your career um, and I didn't really know where to start. We're going to kind of start backwards because I want to ask you about Paris. That was the last place um, I interviewed you, the last place everyone else would have seen you. Um, And I was lucky enough to be there for your um, Uneven Bars final. It was the last competition of your Olympics. Age of 32, you're getting to an individual final at your third game, 16 years after your first games. I mean... I know it didn't go to plan, but can you talk to me about what it felt like to walk out there? I think just the whole experience of Paris for me was generally just really special after everything. And I think looking back on some points of my career, I think you kind of took for granted a bit what I achieved and what I'd done. Um, So just to actually be at a Games is generally just a really special moment. And I went there with the intention of trying to make a bar final. Um, I hadn't been on a world stage for three years until that point. So there was a few, not doubts in my mind, but it was like, how is this actually going to go? How am I going to feel about it all? But I do feel really at home kind of on the big stage. And I think to be able to go out there and without the final going to plan, but still be able to show some of my best work, that really meant a lot. 
Yeah, I mean, for, for some people who might not have watched the final of the uneven bars, um, your routine was going really well and then you fell off the bars. It was, I mean, your face, when it happened, you could tell you were kind of shocked. I know you said afterwards you'd never really fallen at that part of the routine. Um, but afterwards in the mix zone, almost immediately, you came out and something you said struck me. You said, um, I, I fe- you said, I feel like this is, just how it was meant to happen and that really struck me because you had that kind of clarity of thought in such a difficult moment to already kind of feel like you understood and I just wonder where that clarity came from because there must be so many emotions but you still felt like you could understand it. I think the build-up to that day was like a lot and I think a lot of people that had followed my journey knew my story knew how much it actually meant to if I did achieve an Olympic medal, but I was trying not to put too much of that pressure on myself because anything can happen in gymnastics. And to be honest, in my career, more often than not, it hasn't turned out that well. Um, I did feel really calm. Actually, I didn't feel too nervous. Just training had been going really well. And like I say, when it, that was my immediate thought as soon as I came off. Like the routine was going fairly well. I missed one combination at the start, but that was what I also did in the team final. So I kind of was like, reset, just, you know, just do what you do. Um, And that has been a point in the routine where I fell at that point in my European final. So it was actually a point where concentration was pretty high um, to be like, just be normal and do what you do. And then I generally didn't feel like I was off until I was kind of on the floor. And that's when it was kind of like, if it was just to me how it was supposed to be, because I hadn't dropped that release the whole time I'd been out um in Paris um from when we kind of got into the village space and like I say training had gone well I felt good about it and it was a shame because if I'd have stayed on the medal was there um but I don't regret going for the difficulty because I knew I needed to do that to try and finish on a podium and um it was a sh- it was a shame but yeah just putting into everything into perspective I'm like I can't be sad at my delivery of performance here after coming back from so much yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I also wondered if since then, how much you think about that moment or how have you watched it back? Is it something that is hard to watch back or do you feel proud of it still? Because you should do. But I just wonder how you feel as an athlete who would be a perfectionist about it anyway. A bit mixed. I think for that first week, it was kind of just replaying not just my final, but also what happened to us in the team because the team, we were also so, so close to a team medal. And I think everyone did an incredible job. You can always think what if. Um, and there was, has been a couple of those moments and it's like, just why did it, how can you be so close twice and it not quite work out? But again, I do think everything happens for a reason. Um, it doesn't take away the quality of what we we put out there as a team and also what I did individually. Um, and also I think it's like learning from everything. And throughout my whole career, I've tried to do that. Like what positives can you take? What were the negatives? Um, if I was to stay, what can you do better? You know, those type of things. So, um, yeah, I think looking on reflection, the, the biggest feeling I think is just I'm really proud. And so many people that have either been inspired from watching the performances or people that have supported you throughout the journey to kind of be able to see and showcase, like I say, my work, that really did mean a lot to me. Yeah, I, I was so happy as someone on the outside, but who has been a fan of yours and followed your career to see kind of, a lot of people showing you a lot of love throughout the Olympics was really just heartwarming because you've had an incredible journey and this was an incredible comeback, which we'll get to. Um, But I want to take you back first to the very beginning um, and how and why you fell in love with gymnastics at the first time, uh, in the first place, yeah. I really just got into the sport through a friend at school. Um, Before I did gymnastics, I did dance and I obviously enjoyed dance, but as soon as I got into the gym, it was just so different. And I went from doing two or three sessions a week at seven years old to nearly 30 hours a week by the time I was nine, 10. And it just drastically changed my whole life, my family's life, because we had no idea really what the sport was about until I got into it. And I wasn't particularly that good at it when I was little. I just loved it. Um, And I knew I wanted to be better and improve. And I think in our sport, well, it kind of in any area in life, you can't be perfect at anything, but in gymnastics, you're always chasing perfection that doesn't really exist. Um, so there was always something new to learn or something more to improve. And I think that's kind of 
what really stuck with me. And throughout my whole career, I've just loved I've loved learning despite the challenges that have come along the way. Just the learning that I've taken from it, I think has been been fascinating. Yeah, I love that you say that that at the beginning you weren't that good at it. And I, I feel like that's something that people maybe would be surprised by when you see an elite athlete, you think they must have had this kind of natural talent. They must have been the best when they were so young, but you didn't, you, you weren't, I guess. Do you think that stuck with you throughout your whole career? Um. A little bit. And I think the funny thing is actually bars was my worst event. Like I was not good at it and I found it really hard. I was behind my group. Like when I first moved to my club, not like there was just skills that I just couldn't do. Um, And by the time I was probably, I'd say around 12, the talent was clearly there. And then it was like, how do we harness that? And um, I mean, I could never have predicted what my career would be in my wildest dreams. Like I genuinely just got into the the sport because I loved it and I wanted to be good at it. Um, But I never believed at that time that it would become like my, my career and my life yeah I mean you said it changed not only your life but your family's um can you talk about that because your sister Ellie obviously became a, a gymnast as well and I think like when you say 30 hours a week that's a, a lot of time to spend in the gym that comes from your sacrifice but also your family putting everything into it as well can you talk a little bit about that yeah, it had a huge impact on family life because I was one of five. Um, so just, I don't really know how my parents actually did it, getting me to and from gym. And my mum didn't drive for a lot of like my younger years of gym. So a lot of it fell on my dad. And um, that was one of the reasons why Ellie started gymnastics and started so early. Because when she was a toddler and it got to the point where my mum could drive, she was with obviously my mum all the time and it was rather than just having her sit around at the gym sometimes when they had to wait for me it was put Ellie into preschool and just keep her occupied and that's kind of how she got into it and incredible that she just happened to have that talent as well which was her career was much different to mine from the start because she people knew about me and they picked up on her talent much much earlier um but yeah it the whole family I think just the sacrifices of me missing holidays and then when, when it became Ellie doing that as well there's loads of events that it's like oh, actually we can't do that because we have a competition coming up or we're training the next day and um when Ellie actually retired my brother was like straight away like when are you retiring <laughs> um <laughs> like we want the family back together properly because it is like a huge commitment but I think at the same time as we became more successful they did really understand how much time like it wasn't wasted like we were actually doing it for a purpose and ultimately it was changing our lives as well Yeah, I I mean, also having your sister there, your sacrifice feels shared in a a big way as well, I guess. I know she's quite a bit younger than you, but having her there must have given you a support that um, few other gymnasts would have been able to have, I guess, in those moments. Yeah, I think some of my best years of my career, like looking back for when I was actually with Elle and like I say, we kind of took things for granted. I think how good we were at a point and what we were managed to do in doing the sport, how we were managing to change it and actually achieving all of that together is quite is really quite rare and quite special. Um and yeah, definitely moments that we can look back on and be really, really proud of. And um yeah, it's still still just feels a bit crazy, I think, taking it all in. And I don't think I've really had the time to take it all in. <laughs> I bet. And I mean you talk about those achievements. You competed at the Beijing Games competed in Rio in 2016 and then from a results point of view I guess your career high was 2019 the world championships where you won an individual world um, silver medal in uneven bars you did that in the same week that Ellie also won an individual medal at the Worlds talk me through those memories because um, very few athletes will be able to say they've done what you've done but to have done it at the same time as your sister like you say is pretty remarkable yeah I think I could say growing up in the sport gymnastics wasn't really where it is on the map now for Great Britain at least um I think being able to be part of that generation that's kind of pushed those boundaries and taken the sport to a new level has been really exciting but at the same time I would say that more my my generation I call it generation guinea pig because we were going through a lot of this process that we didn't have a lot of education about we were just trying to push boundaries and it was great but then at the same time a lot of great area and I think we made a huge amount of mistakes and I think that's something that I found really interesting is kind of the mistakes that were made and how do you learn from that and a lot of my generation now either didn't survive it or didn't make it through that whereas 
being able to kind of, I think, just taper through it and apply what I believe has been correct to like my later part of my career. I think that's one of the reasons why I've been more successful. Um, but it took me a really long time and a lot of trial and error and a lot of injuries and, and challenges, to be honest, to learn that. Um, and then having Ellie kind of join along the way as we were kind of in, I guess, in the middle of that process a bit. But I think as I got to, towards 2019 Worlds, that was when I was really actually allowed to take ownership of my work properly and especially not just at home but within like that national environment and space um I do believe that's when my career really started to change in terms of I I really understood it as much as I was really late in the game for gymnastics I do feel like I understood the sport the most at that point and then I think from that point it was then just constant challenges um for the last couple of years and I've not really been able to use that knowledge I think like I found I think Paris was then kind of like the reflection of it all kind of coming together and for the final it was a shame that it didn't come together but I think two out of three of my comps there were great um unfortunately the one that was kind of like my medal shot wasn't wasn't the one that turned out but I don't think I can look back and after everything be any type of disappointed because most people definitely would not have stayed through through all of the challenges yeah, I mean, you, you refer there to the challenges, the mistakes. Let's go to 2020 then, because after the high of 2019, you win a world medal. Then in 2020, it should have been an Olympic year. Obviously, it wasn't because of the COVID pandemic, but it also all unraveled for your sport. Um, for those who don't know, British gymnastics came under fire from a number of former gymnasts who said that systemic abuse existed within the entire system from grassroots right up to the elite level. Dozens and dozens of gymnasts just started speaking out about physical, emotional abuse, um, also kind of fat shaming and, and things around that and body shaming. And you and Ellie took the decision to become the first active national team members to actually speak out and join these people, these whistleblowers. Can you talk me through what went through that decision? What was it like to watch your sport being kind of picked apart and also to decide ultimately to to join those whistleblowers? Yeah, um, I mean, throughout a lot of my career, and I think as I, especially as I was coming into late teens and getting older, you could see a lot of the mistakes and the things that weren't good about the sport. But again, you didn't feel brave enough to really t try and voice it. And it got to a point really for me where I think 2018 was actually a really pinnacle point of my career. I'd been really quite injured for a lot of my career. I was learning more. I was getting braver at kind of speaking up. And from Rio until 2018, I'd kind of not been in this squad environment too much for big comps because I'd been out with injury. And then coming back into the environment was the first time I really voiced like, I, I'm I'm anxious to come back in because I've had big injuries and newer injuries since. And how do we manage that? And trying to voice that, I think that was the first time I was brave at trying to voice it. And ultimately it did kind of backfire because as I got into the environment, some changes were made, but not enough. And I ended up coming out with another injury straight away. And that was really hard to kind of take because... And it was a highlighting point for me because I'm like, if I'm 26 and I'm re I've been had the career that I've had, had the results, like they know I'm not an athlete that doesn't like cheat the work. If I can't communicate this and protect myself, then how does a youngster do that for them? And um, I think a lot of the staff behind the scenes also knew the reasons like behind this newer injury. And it was how do we make these changes? And towards the end of that year, that was the first time within the system I was brave enough to speak to people higher up, try and get my point across. And 2019 was when I actually really did start seeing changes. We were starting to get more program individualization. We'd stop being weighed. There was a lot of things that were going on behind the scenes that I think the Gymnast Alliance brought to light, but some of those retired athletes hadn't seen actually that we were making already making progress. Um, and then I think once... Athlete A came out, the documentary on Netflix that highlighted so many of the issues within the gymnastics culture. I know it was only a matter of time before this was all going to come out at some stage. And I think with it being the COVID pandemic over lockdown, everybody was at home. It got a lot more attention maybe than it might have done if we weren't in a pandemic maybe. Um, and it just felt like a cause that was too important to not put our voice to. Like I'd always said, whenever I retire, 
I'm going to speak. Um, I think that that was a thing people weren't brave enough to do it whilst they were in in the system. And to me and Ellie, I was like, there's nothing more important than this. Like our voices are important. And if we can get that message out and we can help, then I think we need to. And my mom did actually say at the time, are you sure? Like you've, you're still in it. Like you've got your careers ahead. And I was like, well, we've got to be mindful about how it's done. And that was a thing that was so difficult. I think after we were so careful as to how we put it out. We spoke to the performance director at British Gymnastics like together before we did it and said we were going to add our voices and it was agreed and confirmed. And um, we hadn't said exactly how. Originally, we were going to try and do a video, but we couldn't get it right. And we knew that media were going to pick up on this so heavily. Um, so doing the statement and making sure it was worded so carefully um, to then kind of get the backlash that we got, I think that was what was really difficult. Can you talk a little bit about what exactly you highlighted in that statement and why you felt it was important one but also um how many years you had kind of been silent on it like what it was like to kind of be silent in this what turned out to be uh, and what what kind of became public as kind of a culture of of abuse and and kind of bullying that was going on in the background yeah um it's really hard to kind of put into words because I think everybody had such similar experiences but also really different and I find the term abuse really hard to manage because I don't personally feel like I was abused even though that's what it, mm. the bracket that it falls under um but I think from what I experienced and a lot of gymnasts did was just the overtraining and that I think at the start of my career I genuinely believe that coaches didn't know better and they thought that's how it was and it was a culture thing you saw it worldwide the best gymnasts in the world when I was growing up were China, Romania, Russia. And that's what we kind of aspired to be. And I think coaches picked up on those methods, but just genuinely believing that that's how you make a champion in gymnastics. But then I think we got to a point around kind of London time, I would say, where just the whole sporting world was evolving, like nutrition was improving, strength and conditioning. There was all these other factors that we just, I think, chose to ignore as a sport, to be honest. And the coaches were still on along this mindset of, well, gymnastics is different. And we had lots of people coming in to our sport after London, um, like nutritionists, S&C, um, psychology, um, as we got more funding. And essentially, those people weren't really being listened to and they weren't being utilized. And it got to a point where gymnasts were starting to get a bit older. And the mentality was that it, everybody does the same. And it's like, you can't do the same workload as when you're 10 through to 16 then through into your 20s like bodies are different bodies are evolving and I think that was just the lack of education and knowledge that the coaches weren't willing to make these changes as to then it caused so many problems and I think the biggest problem along with the injuries that I saw was the issue with the weight and gymnastics and it is a sport where we are essentially judged on our look so it is important and even as a high level athlete now, still as a high level gymnast, if you are heavier, gymnastics is harder. Like that is a fact. The lighter you are, you flip more, you spin more. Um, but it's doing that in a controlled and mindful manner. And I think, again, growing up, the best were like China, Russia, Romania. And they essentially wanted you to look like a prepubescent child. And that was not sustainable in a healthy way. And I think that's where it got so dangerous because we were stripped of carbohydrates. We were just told, I grew up pretty much told to eat salad and soup. Like that was kind of, <laughs> it's not, it's not great. When you're like exercising what, like 30, 40 hours a week? Yeah. And um, my very first Commonwealth Games that I did when I was only 14, I remember being in that village space, being away from home for the first time. And the coaches there said for dinner, we could either have salad or cereal. And I'm like, I didn't really like salad as a 14 year old child. So I'm like, well, I have cereal then. And I just had cereal for dinner for the, like the re remainder of my time there, which when you look back, that's such a poor, such poor education. Um, and also like, where's the fuel it, like properly. And again, I think it was just a massive lack of education, but I think it was so dangerous. And especially when gymnasts were so young, they didn't know when we, you're a child, you listen to the adults around you and, that caused so many problems and was really sad to see through not just my own career, but my, my teammates and the people around and being able to actually have an impact on that by the end really did mean everything. And I think Ellie 
unknowingly was a really key person in that uh, shift because I got to a point where I was very much a mature adult in the sport and I would always try and learn, I think from my mistakes and help Ellie as much as I could. And it got to a point around 2017, 18, where Ellie had been quite injured. She had a lot of ankle injuries and her weight was a massive topic of conversation amongst the staff and the coaches. Um, and I understand that it was majority trying to get her, to helping her to try and lose some weight. But it got to the point where it was just a focus of every conversation. Like you were kind of stripping Ellie of her identity because everything was just about her weight. She'd go and do a strength session and they'd be like, how's your weight today? She'd go in the gym, how's your weight today? And it got to the point where she sat down and actually cried to me and she was really upset. And she said, I don't feel like I fit in in the sport anymore because most gymnasts were either small and skinny or they were no small and muscular or tall and thin. And she was kind of both. She was muscular, but also really tall and it wasn't a physique that the coaches were used to seeing. And I just said to her, like, for a gymnast, like, yes, they might want you to lose a couple of pounds, but they'd given her a, a complex for life. And I remember sitting down later on with the national coach and saying, look, she's an 18 year old girl and you've given her a body complex image forever. Like she hates her body. And regardless of the sport, like that's not okay. And I remember having then conversations with our physios, other people and just saying, like you need to lay off her like it, it's her decision it's her career and they kind of came back and were like well what if she quits and I said then she quits it's Ellie's career and it's Ellie's choice like she will figure this out on her own but the more pressure you add the more she's going to walk away and after these type of conversations this is when we stopped being weighed collectively like as a squad and it was kind of like the summer of 2018 and at the first right. I thought it was a trick because we'd go to squads and we'd be weighed all the time like every day we'd get weighed in the morning that was just routine and then so occasionally they'd forget <laughs> so I kind of thought oh they just haven't remembered and then when it stuck that made a real big difference yeah I mean I think most people couldn't really imagine being in that environment where one your weight is a topic of conversation with your coaches who are meant to be supporting you but also being weighed every day like who is that going to help it's great to hear that it started changing after you basically took it into your hands to kind of defend your sister and, and her experiences. But like you say, a lot of the retired gymnasts who had experienced all these things um, in 2020 decided to speak out and you decided to to kind of join them and to say, look, they're, they're right. These things have ha happened. Um like you say, you are still an active gymnast and you were both putting a lot on the line to to speak out. Your mum said to you, are you sure you want to do this? Can you talk me through what happened next and also whether you could have ever imagined the impact of, of speaking out and how that would kind of impact your career? Generally, at the time, I didn't think I wanted to make an impact in terms of making things better, but I didn't really think what would then follow would, if that makes sense. Um, and initially it all seemed okay. So towards the end of that year, I actually ended up having a meeting with our performance director, our head of medical, uh, one of our national coaches. And they were kind of like, you know, you've got the most important people in this room to make things right. And we want to hear it all and we want to make it better. And it, it that conversation was great. And, or at least I thought it was great. Um, and they apologized for things and you know we were very open but then i'm not entirely sure what happened then from that point to then coming into the following year because by the time we got into the next year it just felt they just felt like there was a massive shift and there was definitely people in the system that had our backs and supported us but just decisions just felt like everything was not working in our favor and at first you can kind of think mm, maybe this is you know things were different because we were coming through a pandemic Everything was behind closed doors at that point. So no Olympic process was going to be kind of normal. But then areas where normally you'd ask for help and it'd be like, we're going to try and accommodate this as best we can. It just felt like everything was being, everyone was being difficult. And it was like, well, we worked through it as best we can. And then I think as the year started to add up, it was very obvious to us what was going on. And there was definitely certain people involved in the sport still that weren't happy with what we'd done. And this was like, so it was clear like retaliation and even down to some of the staff um 
there was people there that they were supporting us and they were getting they were getting stick for really having our back and, and showing support towards us too um and yeah I never thought like when you'd done so much for a program essentially like I said we were so careful how we put out our statement we didn't purposely didn't name anyone we tried to word it purely from our own experiences um I didn't think it would have that effect and then I can't say we definitely didn't make the Olympic team because of that but I think there was a lot that added up towards that for both of us to be reigning world medalists and then for both of us not to make the team doesn't really feel like that much of a coincidence and I know there's a lot of people on the outside that could say we didn't perform and things didn't add up um but at the same time there's a lot of reason that kind of went behind that and if you understood really what happened behind the scenes it felt like we were really being tripped up at every hurdle we had instead of actually having support and help um and we did the best we could with the circumstances that we had really and it was a really hard time I think and uh, looking back and it's caused not just so much damage to us personally but I think then to our careers going forward it had a massive impact yeah I, I mean just just on on the point of going into back into the kind of national team environment after you put out that statement I know we've discussed this before but I wonder if you can put people in your shoes what it was like to go back to 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 that environment for the first time and to feel maybe you weren't made to feel as welcome as you should have yeah it was really hard actually I think majority not all but majority of coaches just wouldn't speak to us like you'd walk into a room and normally someone would say morning or someone would say hi you were just iced out and it was very apparent what was going on um and like I say like decisions that would normally we'd have group discussions or there would be an element of help there was just no help and it was just it just felt like how to us how do they make it as difficult as possible to be honest um and it just felt like a, a massive I'd say probably six months of just panic because we're trying to get ready we're trying to pre prepare for our games you've obviously worked your whole life so my career had been very long until that point um and it was hard to feel like nothing was going your way and the help just wasn't there but Again, I think for me and Ellie, like working through it, we had each other, but it was it was a really hard time. Um, and yeah, like I say you don't expect you don't expect when you've worked in an organization for so long, given so much and essentially helped build the credibility of the program to where it was to then all of a sudden just be iced out like that was difficult. But the gym masks themselves were great and we didn't have any issues with any of the athletes, but the staff or some of the staff at least made life very, really hard. Yeah, I mean, you're going through all of this and then to add to this ongoing battle that you're having with your governing body and you're trying to prepare for the Olympics, you're trying to qualify for the Olympics, you're trying to get picked for the Olympic team in Tokyo for the delayed Olympics in 2021. In May, just tragedy struck and you lost your brother. Your brother Josh died unexpectedly from a heart condition that had gone undiagnosed. And it's just... Yeah, I just can't even begin to imagine what that was like. But can you put into words how you reflect on that now and the timing of it as well? It came, you, you found out the news the night before what should have been the Olympic trials for you. Yeah, it still feels like it's not real life, honestly. It's really hard to kind of grasp that it was real and it's like a thing that's forever. Um, especially because Josh at the time lived in Liverpool. He wasn't home that much. We didn't speak on the phone all the time like I'd speak with Ellie most days. So it's really hard to grasp that he's not just still there, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. And yeah, the timing of it, like you genuinely couldn't, you couldn't have written it. Like there was so much going on um, with me and Ellie anyway, um, emotionally. And we I, we were so drained by that point. As much as we were coming into trials, we just, we just had enough of all of, I think all the obstacles really. And I happened to be still at the trials. Ellie had made the decision to leave trials, which she only really opened up about not too long ago um, because she was injured and she just wasn't getting that support. And looking at it now, like you can understand if the Olympics was then in two weeks because you've got to show readiness, but 10 weeks away, like 10 weeks is a very long time, especially in gymnastics. Like you can make big changes within a couple of weeks. Um, and you can see the differences now, like since we've moved forwards, for example, all of our landings, like when we come to British champs and even all of our prep for Paris, like the landings, you're on soft surfaces until the last minute to protect everybody's bodies, even with the younger athletes. Whereas they were asking Ellie to do her most difficult vault while she was 
carrying an injury 10 weeks out in a sports hall. It makes no sense because if you were going to support her, you would uh, have allowed her to do that onto a soft surface so you can show that she's got the, the skill ready, but you've got 10 weeks to get her body then to align with that. And yeah, those type of decisions were tough. And then I could say to have Josh's situation on top of that, you just couldn't even predict that. And as an athlete, I would never expect, and even now I'd never expect to make a team because of my name. I'd always expect to make the team because of my performance. And I genuinely did believe at the time I had a routine that could potentially have challenged for a gold medal. And we needed to get it into competition and we needed the support and the help to, to get there. And that just didn't feel like it was there at that point in time. And that was really difficult. Like when you're a reigning world silver medalist and it felt like you were being hindered rather than helped is, is, is hard. And I think the hardest thing for me was after everything happened with Josh, I know I understand this policies and selections and think, you know, I, again, I don't expect to just be picked, but I did think there should have been a conversation after that. And I genuinely believe that there was no intention of selecting me for that team unless I was doing four pieces. And I think that was the mindset. That conversation was never had. And I think especially after what happened with my brother, that conversation should have happened regardless of what the rule is in the policy. And maybe you can't actually physically say that you should have said that to me because I think it was really cruel to put me through the process that my other extra or extended trial was. And I do genuinely believe there was no intention of picking me. And I think that was awful. And even like at the time we kind of said all the team around me, it felt like a punishment competition. Like that is what it felt like. It was just the most awful thing and the most awful experience and I am a pretty tough person but I don't think anybody should have ever been made to be put through that and not the process of another trial but how it was done um and then afterwards to be told you haven't been selected because you didn't do all the all the pieces all the pieces were never set up in that gym so <laughs> like what what do you mean by that and that was that was one of the hardest points for those who don't know so you found out the news about your brother's passing on the on the eve of the Olympic trials. So obviously you didn't take part in the Olympic trials and you were allowed to have an Olympic trial at a later date. It was still very close to that date though. Can you remind me, it was, was it a couple of weeks? Two weeks, I think, yeah. So it happened on like a Thursday slash Friday, like middle of the night. And our original trial was supposed to be on a Friday and a Sunday. And I went home the middle of Thursday night coming into Friday. And then by the Sunday, we I hadn't had the email, but my coach had had an email offering another trial. And initially I was genuinely really upset. I was still trying to obviously process what had happened in the highest state of just like shock and grief at, within those two days. And there was a clause in the policy that said that highlighted an extenuating circumstance to miss a trial. So from my point of view, I'm like, it doesn't get any more extenuating than this. Like if they genuinely wanted me, they saw me train. I did the full podium session there they'd seen where I was at. You have enough justification if you wanted me to put me in this team, especially with me being a reigning world medalist and that also fell in the policy. Um, but then because so much was going on for me behind the scenes, we we were like, if you don't do this trial, there's no way they're just gonna say you didn't try or not go in. And that that was our mindset. And I was like, I need to, I need to see how I can be in a gym. I don't know if I can train through this. I don't know how I'm gonna be let's give it some time. So I went back into the gym on the Monday, which is really no time. And I had to make a decision by the Friday um, as to where I was going to compete. And the thing that was so challenging, even through this process, like people on the outside saw I was offered an extra trial and this was all fair and this was great. Um, originally, we had an email that said that the trial couldn't be in Lillishall. I didn't really understand that because we'd had other trials there and that's just the National Centre. And it couldn't be at my home gym. Very fair. Like, I understand that, but we could pick the location. So we originally chose another gym that was within my area. I didn't want to be far from home. I knew there was many sets of bars there. So I was like, hopefully I'll like one and, you know, happy days. So I put that to my coach. They put that to performance director. That was agreed. This was one week before my trial. Then that next weekend, they called my coach to a Zoom or to a meeting. Um, and then they said that it had to be in a sports hall. Well, why wasn't that in the original email? <laughs> so to, but bearing in mind, I'm at peak times of grief. My coach then told me that following Monday, she let me train in the morning first because she knew it was going to affect me. The competition was supposed to be on the Friday then. I had five days. 
And I was still going through a huge amount at that time. And she said, you know, we've got to change location. And that was at the point when they suggested that I go back to Cardiff, which was where I found out the news and it happened. And I genuinely couldn't believe what they were asking of me. I was like, it's not even been two weeks. I think this is really unfair. And I pretty much refused to go. Like, there's no way. So then we had to find a venue. We had five days to find a venue. And I was like, why was this not in the original email? And to me, these are all things that I believe were set to hinder and not be helping. And anybody looking back at that scenario, to me, if you've got an athlete that's going through something like that, your biggest point of call should just be, how do we help? (laughs) Regardless of everything else that's going on, it's like, how do we help and how do we accommodate and just make her feel safe and happy and comfortable and the performance will be whatever it's going to be, you know, like you, I didn't, I didn't even know how it was going to be at that time. Um, and that was really challenging. And then there was a lot of other just little rules that were kind of put into this initial layout of the trial. Like when I got down there, the timings were really difficult. I had like five or six minutes to warm up for my events. I was only there on my own. Um, just the really silly things like they made my coach do the bar tension for me undo the whole bar tension as if another gymnast was there to then redo it back up. There's just no need for that. Like, just let just let me train and compete. Um, and yeah, that whole process was, I don't really know how I got through it. I had a great team uh, behind me at home that were really helping. Um, but to go through all of that and for them to make it, which I believe was unnecessarily difficult, to then be like, well, you haven't done all pieces. I just think it was awful. Yeah, I mean, your your whole experience throughout this is something that I know you've spoken about, but has, have kind of held back on because you're still within the sport and you're still, um, yeah, you still want to be a gymnast first and fo- foremost. And to 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 try to continue to try to to make that Olympic team in the circumstances you were in, I, I can't imagine, and a lot of a lot of people can't imagine. I guess. What do you think was driving you to try to make that team in that moment when like you say you were in the midst of like intense grief and I can imagine a lot of your family were probably like look is this worth it but for you you still felt that drive and you still wanted to do it I just wonder what what was it that was driving you I think because I still believed I was good enough and I'd worked for so many years to kind of you don't know if you're going to get those moments again. And I genuinely did believe that I had the opportunity to challenge for an Olympic gold. Like I had the difficulty at that point and it was kind of, everybody knew there was three top bar workers and I was I was one of those three. Um, and yes, it's an if, but there's always an if in gymnastics. You never you never know what's going to happen. The best athletes fall in our sport all the time. Um, but yeah, as again, I, that that was the driving force. And I know that my brother wouldn't have wanted me to stop just because of that. Um, and Ellie's situation was really different because she actually was carrying an injury and she was struggling a lot. Whereas I was training really well up until that point. And only a couple of weeks before that trial, I felt like I'd had the best training session I've ever had in my career on bars. And that was really encouraging. Like what I've managed to do and was still doing despite all of this, I believed I was in the shape of my life. And then to then be told I wasn't <laughs> after just being tripped up at every hurdle, that's really difficult to take. Mm. And then to not make the team, Tokyo happened, you weren't there. Watching that must have been so hard, but also the noise around it. You, at that time, you're nearly 30 years old. A lot of people were kind of expecting that to have been it. Becky Downey's career is over, but you never gave up on your career and wanted to go for Paris. And I just wonder what... what What is it about your mindset? Because a lot of um, people might focus on the outside noise, might have all those doubts and not be able to go through and think about a whole other Olympic cycle, three years in this case. Um, Yeah, what pushed you to aim for Paris when a lot of people, like you said before, in your sport, to be 32 in your sport, going to an Olympics is pretty rare. So talk me through that. I think... It was because I genuinely still believed that I was good. And despite the age, I was actually still improving, which again is also really quite rare in gymnastics. And I guess the final straw was I thought or felt there were certain people within the organization that were intentionally trying to end my career. And my mindset was like, you're not doing that. Like regardless of where I choose to perform again, like 
I'm not having it finished just because you're trying to end it. Um, so if you're going to fight me, I'm going to fight you right back. <laughs> um, and that was kind of my mentality, really. And I can honestly say that the last three years have been the hardest I'd like to think my life would ever be. Like, I think when I got to Paris, if somebody asked me to repeat the process, I wouldn't because it had been so difficult and so challenging. But I would say probably as of really maybe April this year, some really big changes were made for me personally and the right people were trying to make it much better. Within the organisation, you mean? Yeah, and through, since I did come back, I'd say from like 2022, there were certain people that were trying to make things right. But I don't think I understood me personally how much it had actually affected me and bothered me and how much damage had been done until I started to get back into it and started competing more and certain things were I guess tr were triggering me mentally and I didn't I didn't understand that because I'm naturally I think I'm just really tough and we'll just push through things but there was so much that was constantly happening it was becoming pretty much impossible to try and train through it all and towards the end of last year was when I started to see more of a psychologist uh, understood things a little bit more got more context of it I guess and then it was kind of putting it to BG at the start of this year and it took them a while to I think just again to understand it it took me a it took me nearly three years to understand it and then like I say from about April that was when decisions were made that actually I don't have to go and train at Lillishaw anymore and the weight that kind of came off my shoulders just from kind of hearing that I didn't know how it was going to work I don't think they really knew exactly how it was going to work because it had never been done before. Um, but the fact that they allowed me to do it, I think is what allowed me to then perform how I did at the Euros and perform how I did in Paris. And I'm really grateful for the team that kind of stuck with me and, and helped make those changes. And I think being able to show that actually we can do this differently and it can still work was, I think not just important to them to try and promote the changes that they are trying to make within the whole of the organization, but also to support me, I'd like to finish my career really. Yeah, and for those who don't know, Lilla Shawl is the is the National Gymnastics Centre. It's it's where everyone would train in the national team. Um, so for you to be able to identify that the environment that you're in is as important as what you're actually doing in your routines, and it was it was stopping you from being able to perform at your best. I mean, it seems like a simple thing to be able to let you, um, yeah, be in the best environment possible. But I'm glad that eventually you got to have that. And um, talking about Paris, it, I, I find it really interesting to think about the mindset of Olympians anyway, because you, you spend years kind of visualizing this moment for you when you stepped out in that first competition how did it match up to what you'd imagined because like you say you went into it thinking I don't know if I'd do this again because it was all so hard the last three years did it feel worth it it did actually I was really trying to take the whole experience in because I genuinely thought it was going to be like my last when I was out there so just making any games is special but to be able to actually say i made three games and after everything that games was so different for me for so many reasons and I think walking into that arena and just day one of comp was actually really emotional because I'm like well whatever happens here the fact that you're here is actually it does feel like a miracle and there's so many people that actually would never would wouldn't have put up with half the amount that I've had to um and like I say the performances I think being able to get some of my best work out there really did mean a lot for people to actually see that. And I think also leaving Paris, I feel like a massive weight's come off my shoulders again in terms of, I kind of felt like I hit rock bottom and had to climb my way back up from not really doing anything wrong. <laughs> like I kind of went from being world number two to then like out of a list to even be making a team or a team of reserves, which made no sense to me as an athlete. And then having to try and fight back and prove your worth again when I uh, say you didn't really do anything wrong and I actually did perform pretty well it wasn't my best 100% but there was no way it was going to be my best with all the obstacles that were kind of thrown in the way um but yeah to kind of have that work showcased again that meant everything and just from qualifying um to kind of people were actually the other people in the gymnastic community around the world celebrating that you're still here, you're still around. And 
that just meant everything regardless of the results to show that you know it wasn't all for nothing I actually am still really good at this <laughs> and my bar routine adds significant value to the team despite yeah. what people yeah. tried to tell me otherwise <laughs> exactly and I mean I felt like watching this Olympics as well it felt like um gymnastics as a whole the whole culture around gymnastics seems to have shifted in a huge way I know we saw that in Tokyo the beginnings of that in Tokyo but there's there's been so much more talk around the importance of mental health because someone like Simone Biles is talking about that there's there were athletes like you even like Simone who's in her late 20s who are competing as adults rather than it being just very young girls kind of on the on the kind of international stage and and under such pressure to see kind of mature athletes be able to thrive in that environment feels like a huge shift for gymnastics as well and I just wonder what you think um whether you agree with that and what you think it says about how your sport has kind of evolved throughout your career you've been there from the beginning and you've seen it kind of change I guess um, it's really exciting to be a part of, honestly, and to know that you've been a pinnacle voice as part of that shift, along with many others. And growing up in the sport, honestly, like we were really led to believe for such a long time that you train and you compete and that's it. Like you can't have boyfriends, they're distractions, you can't go out to parties, you can't stay up late, like it can't basically it can't be done. And I think just challenging those methods, um, has been hard for all of the gymnasts involved that have been trying to do things a bit differently. And I think Simone was so key in it because she was naturally so gifted that she could kind of be laughing and joking uh, in the gym and then just go and do an insane, insane level of difficulty skill. Because some gymnasts still can't do that. They have to be like fully concentrating on what they're doing. But Simone was able to bring that as in that like actually she's so good and look how much fun she's having at the same time. Um, and I think that helped in her own right create this new shift in terms of actually it needs to be fun. And I think also for her personality, it needed to be fun to keep her in the sport. Like she didn't have to stay in it. She was so good. She could kind of do what she wanted. But if you want her to stay and we would, would never have been able to see the greatness of her career if these changes, I don't believe, didn't happen because she needed that fun and that element of being able to have a normal life to be able to thrive in the way that I think that she has. Yeah. And I mean, for you, you, you love the sport as well. You wouldn't be doing it if you didn't love the sport with all of the difficulties that you've had with it. Do you still feel that joy when you get out there and compete? Are you able to enjoy it? Yeah, genuinely, I, I love what I do. And so many people ask me, like, why did you stay? Why are you still doing it? And I constantly get like, you're old and like, I'm for a gymnast, yeah, I am. But I've said to many people like around me, like if it wasn't for my age, people wouldn't just be expecting me to quit. Because I said to my mom, look at Serena Williams, she retired at 40. Like in the grand scheme of that, like at 32 isn't old. It's just because it's not been done. And I think being able to push those boundaries, being able to see that you actually can do both and ultimately I enjoy what I do like a lot of my friends have kind of been like when are you going to have a normal life well my life isn't normal you know it hasn't been normal from when I was small and really other than at this point in time I haven't met my life partner yet um my life is pretty normal like I've managed to buy a house from my career I I own all my own stuff I you know I've done all of those things it's just been done in a slightly different way but ultimately if I'm happy I'm enjoying what I'm doing I'm getting paid to do it like so what like it's my choice that to miss the events or do whatever um for my career whereas now actually the sport does allow you to do that you can go to those weddings go to the parties it's just the only time you can't is if it happens to clash with a competition <laughs> like then then that makes yeah. it tricky but I think being able to do both is is really exciting and I'm excited to kind of see where the sport can keep going and on that point do you see yourself continuing to compete? Was Paris the last week to see? Are you ready to make that decision? I did say to you in our interview that there was a 99.9% .9 that I'm done. Um, at the minute, I, I'm not sure. I love, I say, I love what I do. I'm still really good at what I do. And I just need time to, I think, process it all, think about it all. And um, yeah, who knows? But I'm definitely taking some significant time off because I've never 
it was so frowned upon and I've never really been able to do that in my career. Um, and I'm excited to take that time just to take up other opportunities, explore other areas of life. Like I'm very, very excited to coach and I know whether I choose to stay for another cycle or not, like coaching is in my future for sure. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to be excited about and um, we will see. LA is one of my favorite places in the world. So <laughs> whether I'm there commentating, <laughs> coaching, competing, who knows? <laughs> I love that. And I mean, how how do your siblings feel about that? Because when we last spoke, you said your brother had said to you, if you don't quit now, I'm not speaking to you again. So how does he feel about this? <laughs> it was really funny. I threw, um, when you put that quote online, I threw it into our group chat and then straight away he messaged me back and he was like, I will speak to you still. <laughs> so I'm like, okay then. <laughs> um, but no, I wasn't initially going to tell them my plans and my thoughts. And over the last week or so, they know more of what I'm kind of planning and thinking of doing and that they're on board like they're going to support me either way whatever I choose to do and I just think I don't know where my life's going to go in this next year um like I say I want to take up other opportunities I want to get out the gymnastics gym and try other things in my life and um and just see where we're at after that point great and just on a final point because your career and what you've done outside of the gym in terms of speaking out has had such an impact. I just wonder how you feel now about British, British gymnastics as an organization. Do you, where's that relationship? To be honest, even despite everything, like I never hated them. Like I hated what they did to me personally. Um, but also like, I wouldn't have the career in the life that I have without some of the really good people that have been involved in the system. Like, there's been a lot of bad stuff, but they're not all bad people. And I think it is encouraging to see the shift. It's been hard. And I say what happened to, to me and Ellie, like should never happen to anyone. And there's many other gymnasts that have had awful things happen throughout their careers that never should. But the biggest thing for speaking out was to make sure it doesn't happen to the next generation. And some of the changes that I've just seen, like I hadn't done a Europeans for a while. Um, this year was the first one that was like a junior and senior one. But seeing how the juniors are coming through in terms of just they're able to really communicate and speak to their coaches. We can go to dinner and there's like an open spread of food. They don't bat an eyelid about going to get food. Whereas even some of the seniors are a bit more cautious of like who's watching because of what we pre previously experienced and been able to see that with the younger generation is huge. Um, so hopefully that in itself will eliminate a lot of problems that we previously had. And I think just continuing to be part of the change, like I'm still in talks with lots of people at BG as to what we can do to make it better. There's still a lot of mistakes that I'm seeing, even at the top level with some of the senior kids. There's like, you need to do this better still. Um, and it's still make it a safer space where people really freely can speak. Cause I still think that that's a bit of a gray area that, and it needs improvement, but yeah, I think I, for a long time, I was like, I don't want anything to do with it after how I was personally treated. But then I think as I've had time to process, um, there are, st I say there are still good people in there. And I know I have an important voice and I think there's a lot that I can still do to make it better. So I'm prepared to, to do that while I still can. No doubt, no doubt. You will be, continue to be a big positive force, I think, in your sport. You care so much about it and it, it shows in the way that you speak about it it's been so amazing to chat I ask everyone on the podcast this final question which is who's the person or the woman that you admire most either within your sport or outside of your sport who's kind of been a big source of inspiration during your career that's a really good question I think from an athlete perspective one of my favorite athletes was Kelly Holmes um after reading her her book, being able to kind of just relate to having so many challenges and having the results in her career at a later age. Um, that was someone who was always inspiring to me. Um, but other than that, I, I don't know. I think I, just probably the people I have around me, I would say I get a lot of inspiration from them, like the care and level of support that they've given and shown me. Love that. Love that. Well, I can't wait to see what you do next, whether it's in gymnastics or otherwise, and wishing you the best break possible. You deserve it. Um, yeah, comeback queen in Paris. And now I think you deserve a chill autumn. 
So all the, all the best with it. And thanks so much, Becky, for taking the time. I thank you so much for having me on. We're so grateful to Becky for opening up to us about everything she's been through in her sport. Before we go, though, we should add that last year, British Gymnastics introduced policies that ban coaches from weighing athletes without parental consent. And at the time of the Tokyo Olympics, British Gymnastics denied any suggestion that Becky was not given a fair opportunity to qualify for the team, and they defended their selection process.